Hunt Suburbia podcast presents the Living Legends series. A special three-part series with deer hunting legend Lanny Benoit. It was a sunny day and I felt like wandering because back then I was in such good shape and you know I, I just never got tired. So I started wandering, wandering, wandering. I kept going towards the sun in the end of the day, which was east. But my rig was back west of me, back towards Sandy Creek, because that's where I was parked. I was parked just above the um, town garage gravel pit on that entrance. And I was just up there. That's quite a hike across that <laughs> fucking mountain range. Uh, take you all day. So now I'm going down the other side of this mountain range, and... I stopped and I said, you know, I ain't got time to go back. And it's the time I get back there. Holy shit, we late. I better keep going and just go down to the blacktop and get a, get a ride. Well, I took off hoofing it down the road. and Jeez, I looked and it was a guy with a, looked like a Mercury of some type. Fancy, one of them fancy Fords or something. And there was an old guy getting in his car and I went trotting up. And I said, hey, give me a ride. Sure, where are you going? <laughs> Sandy Creek, where are you really going? <laughs> <laughs> Sandy Creek. Well, how'd you get here? Where's your car? Sandy Creek. <laughs> you got lost, didn't you? <laughs> That's what he says to me. You got lost. I said, no, I didn't get lost. I didn't have time to go back. How far was it? Well, listen to this. So he says, <laughs> where's your compass? I said, I don't have one. See, when I hunted up in Maine, I never used a compass. I weren't worried about getting lost. I knew where I was. I was in Maine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. If my dad was still alive, he'd tell you the same thing. Well, I never used a compass. He'd just go in the woods, didn't give a shit. And wherever he came out, where he came. Well, the woods weren't big enough to keep me in there, anyways. So finally, he's going to give me a ride back to Sandy Creek. It took 45 minutes, almost an hour of driving. And he knew that, too. Wow. He's just going to take me almost an hour to bring you over there. You got lot. You need a compass, he goes. You've got to get a compass, boy. You can't be in these woods without a compass. And I tried to explain to him, look, I knew my way back. I said, I just didn't, I didn't want to walk back in the dark. How did you know? How, how did you and your dad, like, know, just know how to get back to the vehicle? Just remembering all the ridges? and some reason, I always, I was always like a homing pigeon. You know, I could be from here to in a fairly new area, and I'd look at way like across the lake, and I'd like that's about three miles. That's not that bad. Yeah. And I'd look way over, and I'd tell my dad, "I'll pick me up over there at four o'clock." Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Yeah. He'd say, "How do you know where that is?" I said, "I know where that is. It was there yesterday with the vehicle." And I explained to him where it is, and there's a cut right there. It's a dead end road. I'm going to be over there, bare ground. I'm just going to, I'm going to check this stretch out, see what I see for sign in here. And my dad used to always say to me, you don't know where that is. I do. Just pick me up there. Trust me. I'm going to be there. Don't drive off and leave me, and then I'll have a long walk, get back out. <laughs> so anyway, so that guy gave me a ride back. Well, guess what happened the next year? Same exact thing. <laughs> I go across that mountain range. It was sunny out. I just went for... You know, I went a little different loop, but I come out in the same place. Same guy was parked down there. The same guy lectured me again. Where's your compass? You got lost again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, so nowadays with all the mapping technologies and stuff and OnX, I've been using OnX, but even, uh, you know, before I used OnX, I was using a compass and I would get, you know, turned around. I'd always figure I'd know like a homing pigeon. I know which way the car is, which way the truck is. And, but then one night it was getting pretty dark and I started walking which way I thought the truck was and then looked at my, my compass and it was the complete opposite way. I don't know how I got turned around, but that must happen quite a bit. Well, I'm going to go back to, I lost my train of thought, but we'll, we'll talk about a compass thing here. I was in Ontario and the camera guy, it wasn't Tom Blaze, had a camera guy with me. At the end of the day, I mean, we've been going all day through swamps and here and there and everywhere. And, and he gets his GPS out and he says, we got to go that way. I said, no, we don't. we got to go over there. He said, I'm telling you, my GPS says go over there. 
I said, I'm telling you, you marked it wrong. I remember when you did that. I said, you marked over there, and your, your compass is, your GPS is telling you to go there, but if we go that way, we're going to have to go through a huge swamp. I don't want to go through there because we're going to be going over our knees in, in, in the dark here. And he says, we got to go this way right here. I said, we'll come out within 100 yards of the car. I took my compass out, and I yeah, that's the way to go, right there. And he argued with me again. I said, all right, I'll tell you what, you go that way. I'll pick you up two hours from the time I get back because that's what's going to take you to go back through that swamp. You better come with me. After that, he never argued again. <laughs> he came right out, looked up, and the rig was parked in the dark. That's and I went in and found a, I found a hunter got lost one time, too, and he was scared to death. I said, don't worry about it. I know how to get out of here. How'd you find him while? Was he shooting his gun off? Or well, he... yeah, I, I see that he was abandoned camp, and I see lights on in it. I want him to pop through the door, and he goes, looks at me and goes, there you are. I said, no, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, yeah. No, I used to put a lot of miles on. Yeah, so you you did. It sounds like you did that one buck. You pretty much ran down till he was super tired. But um, you know, you hear that some people say, "Oh, the trackers are running them down until they're too tired to to move." But that's not really the case most of the time, right? No. What happens is if you push a deer hard, his tongue will start hanging out, and then you when you shoot him, I've shot a few bucks that uh, they didn't want to go anymore. But that's hard to do, though. I mean, yeah. that's really hard. Yeah. I mean, you got to have some stamina to do that. Um, is that probably the hardest thing for somebody to get in who wants to get into tracking is just getting over the fact, like, you have to... Well, you don't have to do that. Well, I you, you can go five days and, and have five really hard days, and then you just want to take a nap and rest well, for a few days. You but. see, that's when I was younger. I started shooting bucks easier when I got older because I went slower and I was more sneakier. I don't recommend that only... If you're young and you want to run, you're better off to be sneaky. And sometimes you jump them out and you're better off to let them go. Just leave them alone for about half an hour. Don't even bother with it. Yeah. Sit down and have a think about what your wife's doing or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just sit out, take a break, and then go and then be sneaky about it. You have to know times to speed up and when to slow down, too, right? It- yeah. Or are you always sneaking as an older No, hunter? you don't want to, no. See, what happens is you get a track in the morning, that deer can be five miles away, you're busy sneaking over here. Well, yeah. you ain't mounting to nothing. Put your gun on your shoulder and go. But you got to know how old that track is. You got to right. know that it's old, yes. you know, that it's that old. So right. how, how do you tell? How do you tell? Like, I've shot deer from here across the lake, and I know they're that that far ahead of me. I just take off. If you see somebody in the woods, they think you're crazy because you got your gun on your shoulder and you're just going. So. But how do you know they're all the way over there? Well, it's just a thing. You're just guessing see? at it, and you've tracked enough of them, and hopefully that's where he's, he is. I give me, don't get me wrong, we've all made mistakes. What? He's right here. <laughs> you know what I mean, shit. I blew that one. Yeah. So you 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 know you blow some. Yeah. Here's what happens when you become a good tracker. You can track like you say five deer. And not even get a shot. And then you can shoot the next five deer. So just what well, just, just the l- way it works. A little luck of the draw there. Yeah, I was in Ontario and I was tracking a buck one morning. God, that was a nice buck too. So he goes into these. Just, I could see underneath the spruces. So I get down on my knees and I'm trying to see, look through, because I know he's right there. And what he did, he went just like this, and he's standing here, and and. Before I got down on my knees, it was too late. I'd already gone by him a little bit, and I got down, I'm looking like right here. Well, about the time I come around like this, boy, he let out a blow, and he weren't no further from here that road from me. <laughs> about scared the hell out of me. <laughs> and uh, he took off running. So I get on his track over there, and I'm following him up through. God, he didn't go 200 yards, and he hooks a tree. When they do that, that means they're deep in the rut. He wants to fight, right? Yeah, he's he's not. He don't care about you. So I jump him out again, didn't see him. Runs right by my truck. By Casper. Right by it. He went right down off that ridge and right by Casper, and he went down into a big bog hole. Get down in there, and I jump him out on a little ridge. 
he goes down off that ridge. Of course, I'm over here and I couldn't see him. And he went down like this and he crossed back over back on the ridge again. I go like this and I come up over that little rise and I look over about from here to not quite as far as that tree right there. Yeah. And he's busy hooking a tree again. He did a complete, he spotted me somehow backwards. He flipped in the air and turned completely around and landed looking at me. And I went, boom. I didn't even use my sight. <laughs> <laughs> I walked over and looked at him. I said, you screwed up that time, buddy. <laughs> I was going to say, I didn't know if you were going to end up getting this one. <laughs> oh, no, I got him. But I, I said to him, well, you uh, screwed up that time. I said that to him. He was still thrashing around. <laughs> I said, sorry, but that's how it goes. Nice big 10-pointer, like one of those deals. That was Ontario, right? Yeah. Dark horns. They have some dark no, horns up there, no? No, he was uh, he was rubbing um, poplar trees. They got dark horns, they're rubbing spruce trees. Mm -hmm. Remember that. They mm -hmm. got real ivory horns, they're rubbing hardwood trees. Yeah, that's what you see a lot in Vermont, of the ivory horns. And usually a deer only rub one kind of tree, believe it or not. Most of them. Like they have their favorite? If this is a spruce tree, and that's what he rubs, that's what he's rubbing. Yeah. If he's rubbing a dogwood tree with a green and the gray stripes, that's what he's going to go out of his way to rub on those. He's got his preferences. Yeah, he wants to rub on small trees like this. You know, some people say, boy, it had to be a big buck. He's rubbing a great big tree. Well, that's not true. And some bucks don't matter what size. I shot him and weighed 260 pounds rubbing a tree that big. Yeah. A little spruce tree. But... Um, scrapes you must have came and came across a lot of scrapes so the type of hunting i've been doing suburban hunting with bow you know scrapes are a big uh scouting you know you want to focus in on, on scrapes so you must have seen some big ones up in the the big woods huh well the bigger the scrapes that means there's more bucks in that area it's not just one buck doing it yeah yeah you know you get a buck that's got a scrape this big one another one comes along now it gets bigger yeah, and bigger yeah they and bigger. keep adding to it yeah they keep adding to it because the more bucks the more then more scraping but uh, I was in Quebec hunting, and we drove and drove that morning. I had brand new snow. Jeez, we finally found a big buck track, and we go around the corner, and there's a guy sitting in the truck, and his kid's chasing it around or walk, tracking it or something. The way back in the woods. So a friend of mine, I drove off, and I said, well, we'll come back 20 minutes later. They won't lie. They won't track it long. <laughs> come back, never gone. I got out of the rig and I looked at my friend Bernie and I said, well, this buck's going to figure out I ain't that kid. <laughs> he better get going because he's going to come with us for the day's over. And I had him about an hour later. <laughs> Actually, I almost got two in one spot, but I I didn't shoot at the other one. I was going to ask you if you ever walked up on a couple bucks fighting out there because they get in that mood when you're tracking. Do you ever, you ever run across them fighting? Yep. See any good battles out there? Well, I haven't watched them, but boy, they make a lot of noise. A lot of grunting and groaning and thrashing and brush breaking. And You see those guys, I don't know if you've heard of them, the hunting public. They're a bunch of young guys and they hunt on the ground with bows. And they like to pretend like they're two bucks fighting out there. And it does attract a lot of attention. You'll see a buck just charging up this ridge after them. They're just making Shane the noise. Shane shot a big one in Ontario. He forgot his grunt call and... Didn't have his horns, and he just took a sticker and started thrashing against a tree with it and making some noise, and pretty soon a big old 260-pounder come floating in doing this. Yeah. Who's in my country here? I'm going <laughs> to kick their ass. <laughs> <laughs> what's, uh, what's your brother Shane doing these days? He moved out. Oh, he's still coming back hunting. Yeah. He moved. He got, he got mad at Vermont, so <laughs> taxes and stuff. Yeah. But still comes up and hunts, hunts Maine and New Hampshire. Yeah, it comes and hunts uh, Maine some. Yeah. Now, what about, uh, you know, you drive the roads a lot doing scouting, right? Looking for deer crossing the roads. Do you find that a lot of deer just don't cross the roads? A some lot of deer, deer get a little afraid of it? or Some deer will avoid uh, crossing roads. For instance, there was one in New Hampshire that I heard about all fall and I heard about it during uh, part of the New Hampshire season 
Shane and I both shot bucks somewhere, and we said, well, let's go over there and see if we can't find that great big buck. He's kind of disappeared. Well, we went all over the mountains there where that buck was at. Come to find out, he was right behind somebody's house, and there was a road that went just like this, and he never crossed that road, and he wouldn't cross the road. I tracked him that day after I finally found that buck. took me a week to find that deer. Because he never crossed roads? He wouldn't cross the road. Yeah. He'd go behind houses. I could hear the uh, mothers in the house yelling at the kids. <laughs> <laughs> They're walking right by the <laughs> houses on the back country there. So anyways, I go back the next day. Sounds like suburban hunting. Yeah. Well, it was still big woods there, but the deer wouldn't cross the road. He wouldn't even go in a cot. He knew better. And um, so I bring a friend of mine with me the next day, and I bring him in there, and I said, Bernie, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand right here. He said, but I can see better up there. I said, no, I want you to stand <laughs> right here. Don't worry about where you can see. Yeah. I know where that buck is. He's going to be right up there. I'm going to make a big swing, and I'm going to push him right down to you, and you shoot him. It's going to be a buck of your lifetime coming right up. Don't move from that spot. Sure enough, I go up there and I jump the deer out. And uh, I'm waiting to hear, boom, I didn't hear nothing. I keep going, I go down there, and here's a spot about this big where he was standing, Bernie, mm -hmm. with the head all packed down, and the deer stepped right in it. I went and got him up the road where he could see better, and I brought him back down. See that deer track? <laughs> Told you to stand here. <laughs> Thought I was mad at him. Well, so that's a thing too that I, you know, I was guilty of that. You get into a night, you get up on top of a nice ridge, and it looks nice, and you can see a long way. It's like, oh, this is a good spot to sit opening day. How do you know? How do you know that buck was going to go right through that that spot there? Because that was his trail back and forth on that low strip of woods, and you'd it seen it hard to figure out. Yeah, <laughs> didn't have been no genius. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd seen it from tracking him well, too. I right? jumped that deer out the day before. The neighbor's dog up the road were barking at me. I was in the woods. <laughs> that, that's why nobody could find that buck. I said, to, after a week, I said to my, uh, Shane, my brother, I said, there's only one place we haven't looked. And that's this strip of land that goes up the side of these two roads here. <laughs> we haven't gone in there. We've been all over this mountain range up there, the tops, the bottoms, the swamps, and that buck ain't up there. We found other bucks, but that weren't him. I said, the only place we ain't checked is right here. I went in there, and sure enough, called him on a walkie-talkie. He's in here. He's right here. Yeah, and the guy that was, the dogs were barking at me. That guy was hunting that deer, too. He'd been hunting him for a month. <laughs> He's right behind his house, like from here, a couple hundred yards behind his house. Now there, that's some similarities back to the suburbs. They'd like the bed up close to the houses. Right, he was. They feel, they feel comfortable there. See that sucker? If we'd had a couple more days, we'd have got him. My buddy Bernie would have stayed there. He'd have got him. Got everybody <laughs> talking about that deer, too. You know, nobody ever shot that deer, and that deer never came back, or something happened to him. Oh, Bernie could have had him. Yep. You got any more questions? Well, what about, what do you see, what do you see with, uh, what, what do the storms do to a deer's behavior? If there's a storm coming in, what do you see that they're doing a lot? Uh, a lot of them don't move. They just find a place to lay down and don't move. Would they they find a place where there's a lot of food around, or they go to a preferred storm spot, maybe where you know they've been there in the past for storms, or they don't got to get up and move too far to to feed, or well, sometimes they're in the swamp, sometimes they're right out in the hardwoods. I've seen them both places. Uh, sometimes they just don't move. Sometimes. Oh, I want to talk about the um, moon phase. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Yeah, let's do that. What do you think about the moon phase? Yeah, I've well, what I've I think I've heard about the moon phase is um, everyone always says like full moons are good days to hunt or new moons are good days to go out and hunt, right? When that after that new moon, and I don't know why, but what what have you learned from your? Well, everything I talk about when it comes to deer hunting is stuff I've learned myself. I haven't read about much about deer hunting or what deer do. I all I know is what I've learned my deer hunting my whole life when I was a young kid growing up. Say you got a week to go hunting, and you got a plan this week out. 
So you can look, nowadays you can look ahead for a week or two and see what the weather's going to be. Yeah. Well, if next week, in the moon phase, it says it's going to be next week, it's going to be hot and sunny, don't go. The hell of the moon phase. Yeah. The next week it says it's going to be cold, snowy, and rainy, take that week and go hunting. Yeah. Because the problem is the deer are still rotting in the moon phase. But they're not traveling in the day because it's too hot. They got their winter coats on. Yeah. I started getting their winter coats. They don't travel much. But the next week when it's cold and rainy and snowy, they're going to be moving around. Well, they'll be all refreshed too, right? Yeah, they'll be moving in the daytime a lot too. So you're better off to... The moon phase definitely is there. And it happens at different phases every year. Like the rut. The rut ain't exactly the same. It may be the same... Same day, basically, next year, but the date will be off. Mm-hmm. I've seen in Ontario, the rut's over the 10th. Gone, done in Ontario. 10th of November, it's all over. Hmm. Wonder why that is. I don't know. I've seen it over <clears throat> before that out there, too. Hmm. I mean, it's just done. They're not walking the trails no more to big bucks. They're just off feeding yeah, well, I guess they're further north, and the you know they the rut's supposed to get over earlier the further north you are, and then you go down oh. south to Alabama, and they can have a rut in January. Oh, I'll tell you what, I've seen it get over in a hurry in Ontario, man. It's, everybody's oh the fifteenth, yeah, the fifteenth. You pff, don't go sitting because you ain't gonna see nothing. You better <laughs> hope you get some snow and go find a track. <laughs> it's always interesting yeah, with the moon. You know what do you what are deer doing when it's a full moon? It's bright out at night. Are they moving more or are they moving less? Less. Because, uh, you know, I mean, they just feel like they're more comfortable in the complete dark. So the more light it is, it's... They don't they don't do nothing. Just hunker down. <laughs> the suckers, when it's, when it's rainy all night, <laughs> they're out walking all over the place. Dark, overcast, same with daytime. They're out walking around. Uh, full moon, eh. I mean, you find occasionally one walking around. Trust me, I've hit the roads forever. Snow on the ground. Full moon, next day, worthless. We will find a track here and there, but if it's been overcast, it tracks all over the place. Oh, it's an overcast night. If it's an overcast night, that'll be the the next morning you'll you'll find the most tracks. Yeah, Yeah. that's the way it's been. Yeah. Ever notice that a lot of people like hunting in the rain? That's because of deer moving. I like to hunt in the rain. I was just going to bring that up. Yeah, that's why they say that. Well, I like hunting in the rain. I always have more luck. Yeah, that's because they're moving. Well, it's nice. To, it's that, that's why I like to still hunt or get around and move around. Is yep. You're completely silent in the rain. You, you killed any bucks in the rain? Yeah, I got wet too. <laughs> <laughs> My whole thing is like you're getting you're getting wet, but. Once you get wet, you can't get any wetter than wet. Well, that's why you use wool instead of all the other stuff. Yeah. Wool, no wool. matter what. Wool's the best. If you, I've hunted in wool my whole life, and you can actually, you're soaking wet, and you can freeze the outer layer, and you're still warm inside of it. Yeah. As long as you don't sit too long. Yeah, wool's the most versatile. It turns into armor after a while, <laughs> but you're still warm in there. So, yeah, let's go through your gear. You hunt, you hunt in wool, right? What do you carry? What, what do you use for your gun? I mean, I know, but for the listeners. Well, here's what happened. I Ever since I was a kid, I hunted. I started hunting with a 270 in 1968. I know for a fact that was the year. So I bought a brand new 270. Somewhere in the late 70s, early 80s, and I wore it out, the barrel. So... I bought another one, and I kind of wore that one out shooting it. So I had a heart barrel put a barrel on it for me. I get it back, and it's a thirty out six. I call him on the phone. He says, "Well, you wanted a thirty out six. I've never shot a deer with a thirty out six, partial to my two seventy, but it's all right. We'll go deer hunting with it." So I use 150 grain, which really isn't the, the ideal grain to use in a 6 165 is better. But my gun shoots so well with the 150s, I'm not swapping it around. Hornaday's. I mean, I can shoot in a lead sled at 300 yards. I can shoot a group like that with my pump gun. So that's the same thing since you when you changed over 
in the uh, the eighties you've been using the same gun. Yeah. Yeah. I wore the barrel out on it, so I just had to put a barrel on it. it comes back on lot six, which is all right. Yeah. They kill deer. I mean, how dead you got to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they both die. You know, they're they're both bad pieces. As far as I'm concerned, a two seventy not six, a two eighty. Those were all really good deer. You know, three hundred eight. Uh, yeah, you hear the two seventy shoots straighter. I don't know how. Uh, shoots flatter. Or flatter. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it does do that. Well, 270, 130 grains got more hitting power at 500 yards than a 150 grain hot six does. It's got more energy. Yeah. It's going faster. Yeah. Cuts the air better. And to use a scope, I think. Uh... I used to use a peep sight, and what happened was I got where I got a cataract in this eye, and I still have it. So then I switched over to a scope. I'd rather have my peep sights back. Yeah, yeah. Well, you don't have to mess with any stuff getting in here. Right. You know? Well, carries good. And, I mean, don't get me wrong. I like my scope. I've shot running deer with it just like I did with my peep sights. And I don't know. I don't have any trouble with it. Have you shot your woodman yet? Yeah, shoots awesome. Yeah. I love that thing. I don't have to clean it. Clean the barrel. I just keep <laughs> shoving bullets in. Bang! Isn't that the best? Yeah, <laughs> the, bang. I couldn't believe that. It's the biggest selling point, and then it shoots great. Well, here's the thing with the muzzle or the guy that shoots a muzzle or a lot will tell you the same thing. A regular barrel, if you don't clean it, you get these flyers. You know, if you don't clean the barrel often enough, you go bang, and you look at the target, and the bullet's way over here. The crimp's a foot away. Yeah. Yeah, or more. My woodsman, I shoot it, shoot it, and shoot it. It don't matter. I keep plunking them right in there. Yeah. You haven't hunted with it yet, right? You just barely yeah, just got it. Yeah, I almost had a buck with it last oh, year. Oh, so you got it last uh, year before the season? Yeah. yeah. And I really appreciate them guys uh, taking care of me. I needed a scope on my old one that he gave me. And I go down there and, yeah, come on down. We're going to put your scope on for you. Okay. I go down there and I got my first woodsman arm and, and, uh, What's his name? Is? Timmy. Timmy, put that back in the truck. Well, I want to put a scope on it. Don't worry about it. We're going to put a scope on it. <laughs> so Timmy sighted it in for me. It all works. And God, that thing shoots nice and it carries good. And it carries uh, real nice, nice and light. And... Yeah. Well, the thing I like about it is I don't get no flyers with it. I just keep shooting it. I don't get no flyers. Yep. It feels like I'm just shooting a. You know, my out six or two seventy. I mean, they got a good rest. They plunk them right in there. You don't see this. The wayward, wayward shot. Well, you scratch in your head when that happens with a muzzle. And now, what would happen if I shoot at a deer and it did that? <laughs> <laughs> you hear people talk about the bullet don't know where it went. So what have you been hunting lately? So you've been, you said you've been slowing down a little bit on hunting, right? You you haven't been going out as much, but what, well, have, what have you been doing lately? Well, here's what happens is I took on this job, 64 houses, about three years ago. And of course, I'm bored. I, I'm getting, I'm in my 70s. I'm 75. So I got to do something. I can't just be retired and do nothing, mow grass or something all the time. I can't do it. So this guy needed someone to give my hand doing a drywall job. So I just go up to this this uh, project and just to help this guy out. And I taped that house and the owner of the project says to me, would you be interested in doing all these houses? I said, well, I guess, probably, maybe. So I made a deal <laughs> with him. I said, I'll tell you what, I'll do all your houses for you. So I didn't think it would take this long. How long has it been? Four years. <laughs> You know, to doing these 64 houses, we're coming to an end now. But every year, he's always got two or three lined up about time deer hunting. And I can't, you know, I don't want to go back on my word. And just one year I took off and I thought I, everything would be fine. So I come back and it was a mess. So last year it worked out where I got a little bit of time to go hunting. And I'm, I think I got a good enough crew now where this year I can take off and, and go shoot a buck. Yeah, that's good. Are you, are you, you need to listen to me. Yeah. If it works out, you can go with me and you can be the uh, the official dragger. 
<laughs> you know what? I would be honored to be the official dragger. Would that be fun? <laughs> I can walk along behind. Hey, there's a stump over there. <laughs> I would love to. Maybe I could take my new camera out too, and uh, yeah, maybe get lucky and get something on film. Well, I know where that big buck. I know there's two bucks that are making the same route, pretty much. I know right where they're crossing. I in, found in that Vermont out. there. Or? Yeah, yeah. So I'm kind of excited about that. If nobody shoots them in the first part of the season, we get some snow, and I can lose 30 pounds between now and then. I'm going to shoot one of them bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I just got to stop drinking beer. Yeah, well. I went to the doctor's the other day, and he told me don't change nothing. And I go, all right, good. Does that mean I can still drink a six-pack a day? What? <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> So you, when you're hunting now, you're just kind of sticking around Vermont. You're you're not driving up to Maine. Oh no, or I want to go to Maine. You I want just, to do that. But I got tangled up with that big buck in Vermont, so I didn't yep. go to Maine. This thing had you know one of these deals. Yep. And it was you know well over two hundred. But if you get one these these days, you're not hunkering, hankering for a second one or a th- you know if you tag out, let's say you get that Vermont buck, would you wanna? Would you still be you know let's get let's go to Maine or go to another state? If and, I had time, I'd definitely go to Maine. Yep. I don't care if I shoot a deer. I just like going hunting. Yeah. I like the, uh, you know what I like to do? It's people like you. I like to get you to learning how to track. We go putting down the road, and here's a deer track going across, and it's a 200-pound buck track. Sick you onto it and have a little talk with you before you go. Yeah. Don't come back without this deer. Pretend this is your food for tomorrow or the next week. Yeah. I want you to shoot this deer. Don't come back without it. You hear me? It sounds like fun. <laughs> but, but you know that's the way I would talk to you. Yeah, yeah. When you're supposed to be sneaking, be sne- don't make no noise. Yeah. Oh, you did, you would act like a coach <coughs> in, in that scenario. You're coaching <coughs> me up, and you did that with Timmy, right? Yeah. Well, I've done it with a lot of people. Uh, Bombardier guy's last name's Bombardier. Um, he went to both deer hunting schools. <coughs> now we've gone to Maine, and we're really deer hunting. And the second morning out, I found this nice, or we found this nice big buck track. Come to find out, it didn't have much for antlers, but it was a, it weighed 212. And I had the same talk with him, don't come back without this deer. But I ain't had much luck tracking. Don't listen to me. <laughs> you got all day to track this deer. Don't rush it. You're, you're going to catch up with him. I don't care if you went by here at 2 o'clock this morning. You just put along and take your time with this deer. He's out in this spot here somewhere. You're going to catch this deer. Uh, and then hardwoods move along, but when it gets looking like spruces, go go sneaking in there. Yeah. Uh, I think around 12 o'clock he shot that deer. Wow, good. So it works. The pep talk works. Well, I had two pep talks that morning. <laughs> uh, oh, I got to tell you about the two pats I got on the head when I was 11. 10 years old. Yeah. So, the other guy can't track. He's got the same box of shells he's had for 15 years. Never shot one of them. <laughs> he's just missing a couple of shells out of the box when I got sighted in. Yeah. So, we're putting down the road, and I look out, and it's bare ground. I see a nice buck track, but I see it more than once. It's in the same spot. I see him going this way. You can see him going that way. I look up and there's a little little pinnacle up there, you know, where the wood yep. goes up, comes down. And deer's crossing there. Nice little peak. You, you can see three, four hundred yards there, a couple hundred yards that way. I says, now listen, Tim, if you want to sit, you sit right there. Within three days, you'll shoot that deer. All you got to do is sit up there. And it looks like a 200-pound buck. Well, I think the second day it snowed a little bit, and that buck coming down through, and he shoots it. And he calls me on my walkie-talkie, and, well, I shot the deer, but I can't find him. <laughs> <laughs> I shot, and he disappeared out in the car. That's not good. <laughs> I said, well, you just keep looking. Just go further up, find his track, and follow it down through. You'll find him. You know, so he found him, finally. I, so I go over there, and he says, uh, if I buy you dinner tonight, well, you got the deer up for me. I've never got out of deer before. <laughs> I think that one went 210 or something. Wow. First buck? Yeah. First deer? First deer he ever shot. Yep. There was something else I was going to tell Two you. Two pats on the head, you said. 
Hmm? You said something about two pats on the head. Oh, yeah. See, I got so many stories. So, way back in, let me think about what year this was. Fifty six. I was just gonna yeah. yeah. Ten years old. Harvey Morse comes through the door. I think it was Saturday or Sunday morning. Comes up to me, I'm wide awake, hanging around there, getting ready to go hunting out behind the house. Comes up and pats me on the head. You wanna go deer hunting with me? Yeah, I'll go with you. <laughs> well, we'll go up to Hayden Hill. I said, Okay. So I got my thirty eight forty, lever action, it's a pistol round. So we go up there, and he goes, well, we're going to hunt the power line. And he said, I don't want you getting lost, so you follow the power line up through. I looked at him, I said, well, I ain't going to get lost. So I'll go up the power line, I don't care. And so he goes up in the woods, and I go up the power line. I get halfway up there, and I look down, here's a buck truck, and trotting halfway across there. And I went, pow, bang. He ran in the woods. <clears throat> Bare ground. So I go down in the woods, and I find the deer hung up. When the deer was running, he got his, he died the same time he got his little crotch in the tree and he got his head stuck in there and he's hmm. hanging like this, his rear end's on the ground. <laughs> I said, well, look at that. I was like trying to pull him out. I couldn't because I weren't big enough. Deer weighed 175 pounds. So, Jesus, I'm standing there. What the hell? I said, oh, I'll holler to Harvey. So I hollered there a little bit and I think he answered me. Well, two guys come along. Pulled the deer out and asked me if they wanted them to gut it out. And I said, yeah, sure. Why not? So they gutted the deer out and one of them come over and patted me on the head. Nice job, little guy. <laughs> <laughs> Harvey's coming sometime and said, okay, we'll leave you here as long as you got somebody. Because he answered again. Yeah. So Harvey come down and dragged it out. But yeah, I got two pats that day from Harvey <laughs> and those two guys. <laughs> now, who's Harvey in relation to you? Uh, just a friend. Yep. Family friend? Yeah, he was just a friend. Yeah. He was a friend of the families. He just stopped by. He said to me, I ain't taking you out no was more. Was that your first deer? No, I had my second one. Yeah. He says, I ain't taking you out no more. <laughs> <laughs> so the next year, 11 years old now, you ready for some, you want, you're getting tired yet? No, no. <laughs> Looking like you. I got stamina. Be okay. I'm just checking this thing to make sure it's recording because sometimes the memory card gets filled up. Oh, it's, it's recording. So Saturday, my mother borrowed my hunting knife. Yeah. Uh, Saturday night, Uncle Wendy's there, and I said, "Damn boy!" And he had a brand new Marlin, thirty-two special, lever action. I kept looking at it. And, I picked it up and brought it over, and I was funneling it, and I was 11 years old, and I said to Uncle Wendy, I said, geez, boy, I'd really like to take your gun hunting tomorrow instead of that 3840. <laughs> well, I don't want it scratched up. If you take that gun, I don't want no scratches on it because it's brand new. He hadn't even shot it yet. <laughs> now, keep in mind the scratch thing. I said, okay. So I go way over on what they call Hayden Hill, over on Cobb Hill, and I'm going to hunt back around because I, I I knew all that country even though I was 11 years old. It's quite a fair piece from the house. So there's some ledges there, and there was a deer trail down there. So I lean up against the tree, and I lean the gun right here, right side of me, leaned up again. Instead of having it across my lap, I should have had, but I just leaned it up here against the tree. Yeah. Well, guess what? I fell asleep. As a little guy would do, well, pretty soon my gun woke me up, fell on my legs, bounced off of my foot. What the heck? And I look, there's a porcupine running that way. <laughs> I picked the gun up and he chewed on the stock. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> I was so pissed. What the heck? Oh my god! Well, Uncle Wendy's gonna be mad at me. <laughs> What's the odds of that? You didn't get a pat on the head that day. Oh, did I did. Pat in the back. <laughs> no, I still got a pat. 
I headed that way. Porcupine didn't do well after a few seconds. So anyways, I headed towards Cobb Hill. I got over there because I knew they crossed over there. And it was just before dark. I looked way across that field, and there's a buck walking broadside to me with his nose up, going like this, sniffing. And I went, pow! And the deer went, and I said, well, that was a lucky shot. That was a long ways. So I go over there, and the deer's still flopping around a little bit, and I shot him again. But I didn't have no hunting knife. And I tried to drag him out of the field, but I couldn't because the deer was too big. So I said, well, I'll just stay here until dark. To heck with it. I don't want nobody taking my deer because there was hunters around. So I stayed there until dark. Now I still got to walk out. So I walked down the logging road there. I come to a camp. There were people there. And it was Pint Sherman there. That's that guy's name that was staying there. That thing ain't even there no more. And I explained to him I shot a buck up there and I couldn't gut it out and didn't have a knife. And I said, well... And he says to me, well, why don't you just go down to the farmhouse down there, Lane? It's a couple miles away, and just call home, and they'll come over and get you. And he says, because, geez, I, I don't want to, you know, drag all night long here. <laughs> At least he was honest about it. So I walked all the way down. Of course, meanwhile, my parents are getting nervous because it's like 6, 7 o'clock at night. Yeah. And the reason I remember this so well is because Uncle Wendy had a brand-new Chevy truck. It was a 57. New Chevy truck and a new Marlin. And he had a new Maryland, and that truck was teal-colored. Yeah. I'll never forget that. It was a brand-new Chevy 57 truck. <laughs> so I go down and call, and Saturday night I got in the buck pool. Every year we had a buck pool, and the family, for the first person that shoots a buck, gets the buck pool. Mm-hmm. I won the buck pool because nobody shot a buck yet. Yeah. So they come all over. Now they ain't worried about me no more because, you know, I ain't here. I'm 11 years old. I ain't back. You know, <laughs> 6, 7 o'clock at night. Where is he? They weren't too worried, but they, you know. So they had come over with their truck and go cut the deer out and drag it out. I didn't have to drag nothing. And all, the scratch of the bite mark on the stock was okay, the chew mark. Yeah? Added some character? Yeah, it was all right. Yeah. Well, it's a story we can talk about, so. <laughs> there, it, <laughs> there it is. Is that the first time you told that story? Probably not. No. <laughs> no it's too good a story to <laughs> get the gun chewed on. Oh, my goodness. What's one of your uh, favorite stories about your dad that you remember? Or hunting with him? Or... 